therefore, some not too happy memories for John Peel in Snapshots. <laughs> John Peel is one of radio's most highly respected DJs. His knowledge and outspoken opinions on contemporary music have earned him a loyal audience over 25 years of broadcasting. John was born in Liverpool. His family would take their annual holidays on the island of Anglesey, off the north coast of Wales, where he'd later return at 18 to do his national service. Now, at the age of 53, John is going back to Anglesey, to recall some of the most significant memories of his childhood. Most years of my childhood, right up until I became a teenager, we came here to uh, Ross Niger for our summer holidays. Mostly we came to the house here, um, which in those days was uh, the Red House, because by and large it was red. And uh, in fact, it was a great deal bigger, oddly enough, than it is now. I come from a nice, comfortable Cheshire middle-class background and for various sound cultural reasons they were not my parents the sort of people who uh, were very much given to demonstrations of affection uh, the affection that my brothers and I did get as children came from our nanny really uh, the excellent Florence Horn uh, known to us as Trader Horn who looked after us up to and uh, after our leaving for boarding school When I was a kid, uh, I used to come down and play on this beach quite a bit by myself. Um, my dad was away, when I was very young, my dad was away tussling with a Hun in North Africa, so uh, obviously he wasn't here. And when he did come back, he used to spend much of his time at the golf club, understandably, with his cronies. And uh, my mother was out with her mates. And my brother Francis, a nice boy, but he spent much of his early years fast asleep, so I couldn't persuade him to come out and play. My grandfather lived at the other end of the beach in Los Niger. Uh, this bungalow, called rather amusingly the bungalow, uh, is the place where my grandfather lived when uh, I was a child. And we came here with my dad and with my mum and uh, various other relatives, but we were always a bit wary here because my granddad didn't like children very much and he particularly didn't like us, we always got the impression. So when we did come here, we tried to sneak off into the kitchen where his uh, excellent cook would look after us and make us even fatter little boys than we were already. I almost expect my granddad to come out here and tell us all to get off his grass and be damn quick about it. Well, my granddad, who was a fairly grumpy old fella, he'd come out here in his flat hat and his bedroom slippers, and uh, there was a stream down here, and it was his obsession to keep the stream clear. Well, I think my granddad would be quite pleased with the general standard of the stream now and its cleanliness. It seems to be flowing pretty well and uh, rather less overgrown than it was in his day. So he'd give the thumbs up to the stream, whoever it is who's responsible for cleaning it. Our holidays were one of the most few opportunities that I ever had to spend time with my father at all. And he was always a rather sort of distant and authoritarian figure, or so it seemed to me. One of the things that my father and I and uh, my brother Francis always managed to do was to go to the island church to look for cowries. What were the Martians making of this? <laughs> Why is that fat man sitting on the beam? Ah! Great sense of relief at finding that, I want you to know. Oh, and another one is lying there, waiting to be... Very good. Add another! Amazing. Highly symbolic act. Right. Uh, this jar has considerable significance in my life because apart from the dozen cowries that I've just added to it, all of these were collected here at the Island Church uh, by my father during our expeditions together. And so when he died, it became quite important to me to try and get my hands on this, as I say, to represent it in his own uh, individual effort, so a bit of a treasure. And of course, this is always the case, you know, when you have sort of little sentimental familiar objects like this, it makes you wish, or made me wish anyway, that uh, I'd actually known him rather better than I did, but 
uh, life tends to be, I'm afraid, something of a crisis of non-communication, and uh, mine's been, there's no exception. The outings that I had here with my dad were particularly important because uh, he'd been away at the war throughout my early childhood. My very first memory of seeing him was an Anglesey. Well, of course, this place is uh, barely recognisable. It's been changed a great deal, and uh, we only spent, I think, one summer here. But it's important because uh, uh, my brother Francis and I were playing in this area, and uh, we heard a motorbike coming by. We ran to the gate and uh, stood there just to watch it go past. And instead of going past, uh, it turned in and it <clears throat> drove round. In this, there was a lawn here, I seem to remember, and we ran across the lawn to the house. And uh, from the window overlooking the, uh, the, the driveway there, uh, my mother looked out, saw the motorbike, and you know, we'd said something like, Mommy, Mommy, who's that funny looking man at the door? And uh, she looked out and said, It's your father, and started to cry. And, uh, I get upset myself now telling you the story. And we ran down and uh, there he was. I was five or six years old at the time and uh, that was the first time that I was consciously aware of having seen him. Being a parent myself now and uh, looking back on my father's life, I often think that uh, he was probably rather an unhappy and lonely man and uh, I wish again that I'd been conscious of this at the time. One of the great mistakes that parents make, and uh, I've tried to avoid making this mistake myself, is to say to their children that uh, I wish you were more like so-and-so. I thought to myself, I don't want to be like these people, and uh, more than that, I'm not going to be like these people. And I think that one of the reasons that I got involved in uh, and was so keen on rock and roll or popular music, whatever, was that uh, it was something that was kind of wholly mine and uh, something over which uh, my parents and other uh, authorities had no control at all. So it was very valuable to me for that reason. <laughs> A very crucial moment in my life uh, occurred here because as a public schoolboy, you have to get back a bit because I need to demonstrate military technique to you here. As a public schoolboy, I was expected to get a commission, right? Because all public schoolboys got commissions. So I was, one day I was instructed to march the squad at the end of guard duty, march them off the ground, right? And this was very important, significant, because it was, you were assessed on these things as to whether you were sent forward for officer training. So this, imagine I'm the squad, right, and you, you're the officer, right? So you know, called, I was standing like this, attention. And then we had to march, right? Now, in those days, there was a flower bed here and I was too nervous to stop them, so I just marched them right over the flower bed, like that. And my commanding officer said at that moment, he said, that was the moment we decided not to send you forward for officer training, at exactly that moment. So if I hadn't marched the squad across the flower bed, then I would have been an officer and a different person altogether. I'd have been a great success. I'd have stayed in Cheshire. I'd have become an accountant and uh, life would have, been, would have been very different. So that was a crucial moment in my life. This is a rum business and no mistake. When uh, I was doing my national service here, there was uh, like a whole village here, several villages, in fact, an entire community. And uh, it was a community that I enjoyed very much and liked being part of. The people who I was here with all came from different backgrounds, different parts of the country. I met Geordies for the first time. Uh, couldn't understand a word they were saying. Still can't, as a matter of fact. But they accepted me for, as, as, you know, for what I was. And, we were brought closer together by football, of course, common interest in football, uh, but also in, uh, in music, because I had a lot of records which I used to play to them. And on one uh, celebrated occasion, we formed a convoy and drove up to the Liverpool Empire to see Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran, which was uh, an utterly wonderful night. There were some good lads here, no question.
Until I came back here to Anglesey, I'd been thinking to myself that when I grew very old, I might even retire here because there were so many memories and associations with the places that we've been to. Uh, after the past couple of days, I think I'll probably not do that because uh, I've realised that you can get so bogged down with your memories and uh, spend so much time interpreting them that it doesn't leave you enough time to go on living the rest of your life. I've come away from here not feeling sorry for myself, which I think I might have been when we started, but feeling really more sorry for my mother and father because uh, circumstances were such that they never really had the benefit of having happy children who enjoyed their company. But I don't think I should be coming back to Anglesey again in a great hurry to work my way through these memories again. last night that I spent the beginning of last week uh, up in Anglesey. Really just going back to the place where I'd served my, done my national service, you know, as a soldier of the Queen so that you could sleep easier in your beds. And while I was there, uh, I bumped into a lad who asked me to play something for everybody in 144SU at uh, Decroix's camp. He wanted to hear the wild swans. Well, why not? This is revolutionary spirit, of course. Mm -hmm. 